Thank you for uh, taking the time from what's a very busy time, obviously, to, uh, to be with us. The schedule for today, you won't see much from me. I'm going to make uh, just a very quick introduction to the ambassador of Ukraine to Ireland, um, Ambassador um, Larissa Garasco, who's going to give some opening remarks from here in a moment. Then I'll briefly introduce the Deputy Prime Minister. The Deputy Prime Minister will speak to us for about 20 minutes, and then there'll be time for questions and, afters, uh, questions and answers afterwards. But thank you again, everybody, for your time and for your diligence and for your patience, indeed. Ambassador Garasco. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am privileged to stand uh, before you today uh, this important event organized by the Institute of International and European Affairs and before the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, Olga Stefanishina, delivers the keynote address on the topic of post-invasion uh, prospects for peace and integration. Before we delve uh, into the details of Ukrainians, Ukraine's path toward peace and the EU integration, I would like to express my my uh, deepest gratitude to Ireland for its unwavering advocacy of Ukraine's European uh, aspirations. From the outset of the invasion, Ireland has stood firmly by our side, condemning the uh, Russian aggression and affirming its commitment to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Uh, your government, parliament, and the civil society have cons uh, con consistently advocated uh, for Ukraine's EU membership, emphasizing the um, importance of peace, stability, and democracy in Europe. Um, Ireland's uh, support has helped uh, amplify our voice uh, within the European Union. This year, Ireland celebrates the 50th uh, anniversary of its EU membership. Your journey toward uh, EU membership stands as a shining example of the transformative power of European integration. Since joining the European Union, Ireland has experienced remarkable benefits across various sectors of society. The Irish economy has thrived, creating, jo creating jobs and fostering economic growth. Uh, investment and trade opportunities uh, have uh, flourished, opening new horizons for businesses. Ireland's voice on the global stage has grown stronger, and its citizens have enjoyed uh, enhanced mobility and educational opportunities across the EU. These remarkable achievements serve as a beacon of hope for Ukraine as we fight for our European future. For, uh, furthermore, Ireland's expertise and lessons learned from, the, from its EU accession process offer valuable insights for Ukraine. Your nation's uh, successful integration journey can guide us as we navigate the complexities of post-invasion reconstruction and our path to the full EU membership. I am happy that today Europe is united as never before in its support for Ukraine. Russia wages this war not only against Ukraine, it is also a war against democratic and European values, the European energy uh, sector, and the Europe European economy. It is a war against the future of Europe, a struggle of autocracy against democracy. Ukraine is literally at the forefront of this battle. It pays the ultimate price and has proven its rightful place among the European family of nations within European Union. I am grateful to the uh, IIA for organizing this event to foster productive discussion uh, in favor of Ukraine's full EU membership. I warmly welcome the Deputy Prime Minister of Ukraine, Ms. Olga Stefanishina, whose keynote uh, address will shed light 
on the post-invasion prospects for peace and our unwavering commitment to EU integration. Thank you so much. See you on the call, Deputy uh, Prime Minister. Just a, a very quick note um, to introduce you and just to thank indeed the ambassador's team, Dimitro Shaderin and, and Daria from the, the, from the Deputy Prime Minister's team for helping with organizing this event. August Stefanishina has been a Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine since June 2020. In this role, Deputy Prime Minister Stefanishina is tasked with overseeing Ukrainian integration into the EU and NATO, as well as coordination of gender equality policies in the Green Deal. A lawyer by profession, Deputy Prime Minister Stefanishina has started her career in the Ministry of Justice of Ukraine, where she worked on the reforms that led to granting Ukraine the visa-free regime within the EU and took part in negotiations on the EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. From 2017 to 2019, she served as Director General to the Government Office for Coordination of European and Euro-Atlantic Integration of Ukraine. And in 2022, the Deputy Prime Minister led Ukraine's EU membership bid that resulted in granting EU candidate status to Ukraine. She's a member of the National Security and Defense Council of Ukraine and chairs Ukraine's Commission for Equal Rights for Women and Men. It's an enormous privilege, Deputy Prime Minister, and the floor is yours for the next 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, uh, addressing uh, the distinguished audience today, I want to uh, say my words of gratitude, not only to the Institute of International and European Affairs, but generally to the, uh, the, uh, the um, Ireland's uh, nation and, and people and uh, your strong stand for Ukraine, for Ukrainians, for Ukrainians who has been uh, forced to uh, escape the war and find their shelter uh, in the territory of, uh, of Ireland. But also we commend on the personal leadership of uh, your government and your parliament to step up with the decision for Ukraine become a member of European Union. This was a tough time a year ago, only uh, three months following the beginning of the full scale war and uh, basically uh, it was not that obvious that uh, that we would have to stand together and we will be backed up by the unity of EU nations to stand with Ukraine and uh, the strong stand for Ukraine of Ireland has been a game changer in decisions which have been taken on 23rd of February and in March over the summit in Versailles that Ukraine will become a member of European Union but now uh, 480 plus days we are still in the in the war of aggression against Ukraine uh, which is one year and three months we have demonstrated the whole world that uh, uh, any declaration of, of military goals and intentions of the Russian Federation is never to come true and will uh, be uh, failed to uh, implement it and never be materialized we remain united in our goal to victory, uh, Ukrainian defenders continue fighting against Russian invaders, pushing them from the temporally occupied territories. Some segments of the front line, we are already uh, conducting elements of the counteroffensive actions. Over the past few days, several settlements were already deoccupied. So uh, although we are able to operate as a government in our offices, the war is still raging on. The, uh, it's, uh, it's an actual battlefield in the center of the Europe. It's an actual atrocities and an enormous and endless source of war crimes being committed for years and three months on the Ukrainian soil, which is the center of Europe. Uh, we, one year and three months, we continue to stay united. We continue sub being supported by the uh, pro-Ukrainian, pro-European, uh, pro-democratic and pro-peaceful coalition. We are grateful for the decisions taken to support the, the peace formula proposed by President Zelensky of his uh, 10 points. We have uh, seen an enhanced and um, uh, and more coordinated military support for Ukraine. We are at the edge of additional waves of decisions taken to provide Ukraine with the, with the fighter jets. But we should not forget that 
at this moment, the war is far beyond the front line. It's also the war against civilian population. It's uh, the war of genocide. Uh, it's the war uh, launched by a country leader of which has been subjected to arrest warrant by international court, criminal court, because of the uh, forceful abduction of Ukrainian children, forceful displacement of them to the territory of the Russian Federation. This is the war against people and Ukrainians. One year and three months, nothing has led to undermining our unity and stand for the victory, our resolve. And it's very important to understand that any politicians who would have to take a decision uh, from the country, which is not in war, have to understand that our resolve is never evaporating until the end of the war. Uh, the very recent, uh, the very recent uh, act of massive uh, ecocide was conducted by Russian Federation by um, uh, by explode in executing the explosion of the Kachovska gas. I, I want to uh, recollect in our memories that even back in May um, uh, 2000 and. 23, uh, we were uh, we were clearly messaging that uh, Kachovska gas has been severely mined, and um, uh, and we see now the outcomes that uh, of this uh, massive exploding, um, and these outcomes will only grow because the water is uh, is uh, growing lower. We now identify those people who didn't manage to be survived, who has uh, drowned in the water. Uh, we have a massive uh, consequences for the environmental situation and following the out outflow of the water, we see a huge amount of the territories which have been affected with the um, massive uh, outflow of elements of uh, of fauna the fish uh, which was simply now lying on the streets of uh, of those cities and residential areas uh, and uh, we are now trying to tackle the massive epidemiological consequences of this uh, of this uh, of this time and of course um it affects uh, a uh, 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 a access to to uh, to water. We have the shortages in in water supplies for those areas on the south of Ukraine. And at this stage, we have just confirmed uh, by our military intelligence information that uh, basically the the cooling mechanism of the Parisian nuclear power plant has been uh, mined by Russian Federation and the Russian armed forces who are getting control of the, over the Parisian nuclear power plant. And with the uh, absence of water in Kachovska gas, the uh, disaster uh, with the cooling system of the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant could have an extremely massive, uh, massive, uh, massive consequences from uh, from the territory of Ukraine uh, spreading throughout the the whole uh, the whole Europe, uh, and uh, in that regard, we should understand that this disaster has no borders and will have prolonged aftermath as Ukraine will not be able to produce food from the region for a pretty long time. This has been the most uh, um, uh, the the biggest source of agriculture uh, production in Ukraine, including the harvest lost this year already, uh, and uh, it will be leading to even greater shortages of food in a long term perspective. And uh, recently, you must have seen that the, the big delegation from the uh, African leaders has been in Ukraine, and this has been the issue of the discussion because, because it would definitely affect the uh, functioning of the of the the green corridor and and the scope of uh, uh, procurement and uh, we can provide uh, these regions uh, uh, which are also affected by the war started by Russian Federation and now in this circumstances also by a massive ecocide conducted by Russian Federation as well so uh, we should not uh, keep our focus out of this uh, of this uh, disaster and catastrophe because every day every week we get a new and new consequences which uh, which would only be named additionally and additionally following the outflow of the water. Um, and uh, in that regard, we understand that uh, it's not only that uh, the war goes beyond the borders of Ukraine from the environmental point of view, it's beyond the borders of Ukraine from the existential point of view. We have to understand that uh, uh, this, uh, the ending of this war, the victory of Ukraine would automatically mean the restoration of the security environment in Europe and the restoration of European security and forming new security architecture with the more resilient institutions for the more resilient planning 
and uh, with, with more resolve to take the leadership in taking actions to defend the values, but not only following the values we are protecting right now. Um, at this point, we also understand that not less important front is the front of transformations. Uh, we understand that we would not have time to hesitate after the war is over. We have to prepare ourselves for the victory now, as the government and the parliament are not uh, the one standing with a, with a gun on the front line. Our armor and ammunition is the politics and the decisions that we can take to make victory closer. And in that regard, I want just to start by informing you that um, the decision taken by Ireland to support Ukraine's uh, membership in European Union to um, grant Ukraine the candidate status was not taken uh, taken in vain. We have done everything possible to make sure that your political will, your investment into leadership and decision process has been uh, shown by commitment of Ukraine, has been proven by the termination of reforms and will be materialized in the hopefully decisions to start the accession talks. Over this year, we managed to um, unite our efforts and pass nearly 100 uh, elements of legislation aligning us with the rules of EU single market, as basically uh, EU has been the major source of exporting with all the borders, including the Black Sea uh, routes uh, uh, blocked. Uh, we have also accelerated our efforts in terms of political reforms and transformations. We have completed formation of all the judicial corps and will start the massive attestation of judges. Uh, we have uh, nominated and selected through a transparent procedures the leaders of all the anti-corruption institutions who show already the first results of their operation. And we launched a massive competition uh, legislation setting up the massive constitution uh, competition for the judges of the constitutional court. And as you might have uh, followed, if you're following Ukraine's reform agenda, we have uh, received a opinion of the Venice Commission basically calling Ukraine to triple in, a, its efforts to tackle vested interests in politics and media in economy of Ukraine. So we will uh, we will taking be taking it as a commitment on our side and we will be doing our best to make sure that by the end of the year we are ending up with the political transformations and start actual implementation and get ourselves prepared for the accession talks in that regard uh, it's very important that uh, basically throughout the war throughout the 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 constant flow of information and and data about massive atrocity about uh, every night missile attacks to the cities of Ukraine and and uh, and murder uh, murdered Ukrainians children civilians uh, around Ukraine we have taking our religion to survive despite of everything. We are staying operational and fully committed to do our work 24 seven. We have never stopped to, uh, to, uh, uh, to to run the government, and you have seen it. You see, you see it by uh, even a number of accomplishments I've managed to uh, to uh, to show you here. And we, of course, count on a geopolitical leadership because now, with the successes on the battlefield, we should be prepared for geopolitical decisions taken to set in stone the security in Europe by a stronger role of European Union in European security architecture, common defense procurement, common defense planning, but also on making a clear messages towards Ukraine's future in NATO. This decision should be politically taken now to make sure that no signals of weakness are sent to Russian Federation. Thank you so much. We'll be happy to participate in the discussion and also answer your questions. Thank you.